Hello Pipe community, Bear Pipe here. Today is a history episode. I want to tell you the story of Sixten Eversen. And the reason is because I'm working on these Sixten designed pipes that was made by Stan Wall at the moment. And I realize I haven't told you his story. And he's a pretty important guy in the pipe world. Uh, in fact, I would argue that he is the most influential pipe maker that has ever lived. Until Sixten came around, there was only one way of making pipes. But once Sixten stepped into the world, he created a second way of making pipes. And today there are two ways. One is Sixten's way and one is the way that pipes were made before Sixten. Not only that, he created the idea of an artisan pipe maker. He's the granddaddy of artisan pipe making in Denmark, in Europe, in North America, and in Japan. Plus, he invented the Danish style of pipes. So that's quite a lot for one guy. So how come this one guy achieved so much? That's the story I want to tell you. So Sixten is in fact um, a household name in Denmark, but he was not a Dane. He was a Swede. He was born in the south of Sweden in 1910. Sixten was not educated beyond very basic primary school education. Well, actually, I don't know that. I, he may have had a high school education as well, but he certainly had no post-secondary education. He was very poor. Uh, his dad died when he was eight, and um, he was one of five siblings. So it was a big family to feed. They lived hand to mouth. Um, Things were tough. Times were really tough for them. And of course, being born in 1910, you count forward in history, 1929 was the beginning of the Great Depression. He was 19 years old when the Great Depression started, just at the point where somebody is launching out into life. He also got married in his early 20s. So in the early 1930s, he's got a fledgling family, but very little prospects and um, not an education that would allow him to leverage any kind of real income in the world. So his brother-in-law takes pity on him and invites him to come over to Copenhagen where his brother-in-law lives with his sister. And uh, his brother-in-law had started a small debt collecting company and needed somebody to go and collect the debts. And Sixten starts working for his brother-in-law. It's a pretty horrible job. He has to go out and collect debts from people who are struggling to repay their loans. He hates the job. And on the side, he does a few things to supplement his income, but also to retain his sanity a little bit. And one of the things that he discovers that really helps him calm down and, and retain his sanity is to work with his hands on things. So he does some woodworking on the side. He also does things, for example, like taking old bicycle wheels and using the spokes to turn them into needles and then selling the needles. You know, real kind of ingenuity, uh, a real kind of practical need to survive, but also really good practically with his hands. So the story goes that Sexton makes himself a pipe at some point, but he struggles with the stem. So he decides to go to a tobacconist to ask them to make a stem for his pipe. So he goes to the local tobacconist. The company is called Serge. Uh, S-U-H-R. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not quite sure how the Danish pronunciation goes. It could be Sears, Sears, something like that. Anyway, I digress. He goes to Serge. He asks them if they could make a stem for him. The owner of the shop looks at the pipe and says, well, terribly sorry. Not only is our lathe broken, our pipe repairman has been sick for months and hasn't been able to come into work. So Sixten, of course, being a guy with a high level of ingenuity and practical ability, immediately offers to make the guy a deal and says he'll fix the lathe in return for him being able to use the lathe to make a stem for himself. And the owner agrees. So Sixten goes in the back, fixes the lathe, makes a stem for himself. And the owner watches him work and realizes that this guy has got some real talent. And he offers him a job as a repairman on the spot. And Sixton accepts because he couldn't, he couldn't get out of the debt collecting business fast enough. So he becomes the pipe repairman for Serge. He stays in the company's employment for over a decade. He works there throughout his 20s and into his early 30s. And 
he later on said that that is where he learned how not to make a pipe because of course every fault and every flaw and everything that broke on a pipe he saw over that decade of working as a pipe repairman and he learned about craftsmanship he learned about the mechanics of a pipe and he learned about the technical aspects of how to make a pipe smoke well all really important lessons that he would use later on in life when he became the artisan pipe maker that we know, now know so the story goes that at a certain point while he's working as a repairman a man comes in with a pipe and says he would like to order a second pipe just like this one but of course it's a time of scarcity uh, because you now also have the second world war taking place the production of briar in italy has stopped and the companies in france and britain that produce pipes uh, are unable to produce pipes so there's very few briar pipes going around Times are tough and it's difficult to get materials. So Sixton says to the guy, I cannot get you a replacement pipe, but I'll make you one that looks just like this one. So he does it and the, 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 the customer is really happy with the end result. The owner sees that and asks Sixton to start to make pipes for the store. And slowly, the word starts to spread that in search there is a guy who makes pipes and sells pipes and you can actually go there and get a decent pipe. It's almost the only place at the time where you can get a decent pipe. Fast forward a few more years, the war has ended. Uh, there's the beginnings of briar coming back into the market, but it's really scarce. It's difficult to get hold of. There's not a lot of it. And in another part of Denmark, Paul Nielsen, is the guy who um, starts Stanwell, takes his company that has been producing um, pipes out of local Danish woods, and he wants to reposition it to compete with the British and French pipe manufacturers. He sees an opportunity in the market. If he can move quickly, get enough briar, get some designs out, he can actually get into the market in Denmark locally and start producing and selling briar pipes before the British and the French recover sufficiently and come back into the market. So he renames his company Stanwell, so that it sounds like an English company, and he hears about this guy in Serge that makes pipes. He decides to go and check him out. Now what follows is, it's probably one of the most important conversations that ever happened in the tobacco world for pipe smokers. Paul Nielsen walks into search, meets Sixton, sees his designs, loves it, and he strikes a deal with Sixton. He asks him to design pipes for him. He would pay him a royalty for the pipes that he sells, but he wants to own the designs. And Sixton agrees. And he starts designing pipes, and in fact, when the first Stanwell catalogs come out, the first nine pipes in the catalog are all Sixton design pipes. And Sixton had a distinctive style. At that point, Sixton is still using um, the classic French and English pipe shapes as his inspiration, using the same methods that they did, same sequence of manufacturing, but tweaking them just ever so slightly, making them, making the shank slightly skinnier and more elegant, maybe canting the bowl a little more, just making slight tweaks to it to give it a little bit more elegance. And people love it. Now, of course, he's now earning royalties from Stanwell on the side. The owner of Serge hears about this. He's not happy because he's not in this deal. And things sour between Sixton and the owner of Serge and Sixton resigns. Sixton goes and opens up his own workshop. Nobody's ever done that before, creating a workshop that makes pipes that's not a factory. Up until this point in history, pipes were made in factories. Pipes is a commodity, it's a cheap object that you go and buy, you use it, once it's done, you throw it away, you get another one. The shapes are all standardized, the shapes are you know, they, there's the, the, the couple of dozen shapes that everybody uses. So, Sixton goes in a different direction. 
he decides to set himself up as an artisan pipe maker. But he continues to work for Stanwell and for the first few years, really, his income comes from two things. One is repairing pipes for other people and doing work for Stanwell. And for the first few years of Stanwell's existence, he does all the sandblasting, for example, for Stanwell in his workshop and they pay him for it. But he slowly starts building a reputation and he starts developing his craft. And the big departure comes when Sexton decides to change the way that he makes his pipes. Because he looks at a piece of briar and he looks at the piece of wood and he, and he sees the grain and the limitation you have when you use, when you make pipes the way they make them in factories is that they'll take the block, they'll draw the bowl, they draw the shank, and then they turn it on a lathe. But once you've drilled the two holes, you're limited in where you can go, go with the shaping of the bowl because you have to honor the position of those two holes. He finds that limiting and frustrating because he sees the grain and he sees opportunities to shape the bowl in response to the grain. And he realizes the only way to do that is to drill the holes for the pipe after you finish shaping it. And this is what he starts doing. You take the bowl on a sanding disc, shape the bowl to what it needs to be. And then afterwards, by hand, drill the two holes that's required, which takes quite a bit of skill, but he masters it. And in doing that, he changes the way that artisan pipes are made forever. Because for the first time, it's possible to look at a piece of briar and to make it what that piece of briar wants to be, as opposed to forcing it into a shape that's predetermined. And this becomes Sixton's signature. His pipes has this organic quality to it that you don't get anywhere before Sixton arrives on the scene. And he builds a reputation for himself. He builds a name as a unique pipe maker. And people start showing up at his workshop to ask how he does it. And this is one of the second things, probably the second factor in what made Sexton so successful. Sexton was a generous teacher and he was a good teacher because he didn't keep secrets from his students. He wanted the people that came to him to be better than he was. He wanted to teach them everything he knew and he wanted them to actually go even further than, than he was going. And he teaches a generation of Danish pipe makers and a generation of Japanese pipe makers his craft. And they take it into the world and become craftsmen of their own, in their own right. I'm thinking about people like in Japan, Tokotomi, who's the, the call it the granddaddy of, of Japanese craftsmen pipe makers, uh, people like Paul Rasmussen, Jess Konovich, um, famous Danish pipe makers who all learned from Sexton. Those guys in turn become the inspiration to a whole new generation of American pipe makers in the 70s and 80s who follow the same tradition. They even draw the inspiration from shapes that Sexton invented, the acorn the blowfish. Blowfish is actually a variation on an acorn. Uh, the bent egg. Yeah, all shapes that that was in a continuum of, of, of work that started with Sexton. So and this is the interesting thing. This it's not enough to be a good craftsman, it's not enough to be a good teacher if you want to change history. There's a third element that's missing. And that is that he was born at the right place at the right time. It's an element of luck in this. Because in the larger design world, there was a shift towards a new approach to design. And Denmark was actually at the forefront of that, the, the early modernists, um, early modern movement within Danish design, which was looking for certain things. They were looking for a fresh approach to design after the war. They wanted minimalism. They wanted to get to the abstract essence of things. They wanted to use materials honestly. They wanted to give expression to what that material could be. They believed that if you did that, 
that you could assemble things into a whole that was greater than the sum of its parts and that you create real true beauty that way. And Sixten, even though he had no formal education in design, naturally has an approach that fits perfectly with that larger shift in society. And because of that, his pipes take off and become representative of um, the modern movement within pipes. His pipes are mechanically sound. He sees himself as a craftsman first and foremost. He makes pipes that smokes well. And he wouldn't let a pipe go out into the world if it wasn't a good smoker. He got the mechanics right, firstly. But secondly, he looked at the material and drew the best out of the material in order to, to bring those two together perfectly. And that fit perfectly in with the Danish modernist sensibilities. And that made him the representative of Danish modernism in the pipe making world. And that was the missing piece, the third piece that was there, that was needed for him to become as famous as he did and as influential as he did. Those are three things. One was he was a genuinely good craftsman with a strong practical bent, but he was also a strong individualist in his craft. He was willing to go out of the box and do things differently. Secondly, he was a good teacher and was able to teach other people his craft. And then thirdly, his, his approach was in alignment with the larger shifts in philosophy that was within society at the time. So he became one of the leading figures in that shift. And that's the story of Sexton. Sexton um, made his last pipe in 1995. Uh, he was 85 years old at that point. And um, he died in 2001. He's followed by his son, Lars Iversen, and by his granddaughter, Nana, who are still making pipes. And um, so the, the Iversen family tradition continues. And in fact, Lars made pipes for Stanwall, and Nana has designed pipes for Stanwall, and actually still designs pipes for Stanwall today. And there's a whole generation of pipe makers in Denmark that followed in his footsteps. Um, in fact, it's kind of an interesting side story. Paul Rasmussen takes over Sixton's job in search when he resigns, but eventually goes to Sixton and learns the craft from Sixton, becomes a craftsman in and of his own right. Tom Elting, uh, Jess Konovich, all these guys were influenced and learned from Sexton in some way or another. And that's the story of Sexton. He was this humble, generous guy who was a teacher. He was passionate about what he did. He was good with his hands and he did what he loved and he changed the pipe world as a result of it. And to me, that's a really inspiring story. And that's why I love these pipes so much and why I am busy collecting the Sexton shapes. There's nearly 50 of them that he did for Stanwall and um, maybe I'm lucky enough one day to own all 50 of them. So that's the Sexton story. Until next time, uh, I will be doing another uh, Sexton pipe that he, that he designed for Stanwall. But until then, uh, thanks for watching.